Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we come to air this week. The ARRL requests expanded HF privileges for technician class operators. We will have a comprehensive report. The National Telecommunications and Information Administration has targeted portions of the 3.4 gigahertz band for potential wireless broadband use. The Hamvention online flea market and inside exhibit reservations are now open and you can now keep in touch with notifications from the Hamvention organizers. Two ham astronauts return safely to Earth from the International Space Station. An on-the-air test of the new FT-8 de-expedition mode is set for early this month. We have news from several de-expeditions, and it seems nobody in the United Kingdom is interested in running for the presidency of the RSGB. We will hear from its current president. And Morse code from your shoes? <laughs> yeah, we didn't make it up. It's a new way for construction workers to keep in touch. And courtesy of the BBC, we will have the story for you in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, talks about operating systems and wonders who will make the next great OS. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, asks, what criteria do you have for your ideal shack? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with another edition of Amateur Radio History Headlines. And we will drop in for the first half of an interview with Thomas Hood, NW7US, on why he became interested in solar weather and becoming an amateur operator. All this and a lot more are straight ahead in special expanded edition number 992 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio. Takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility in Albany, New York, where we just dug out of the snow from our latest bomb blizzard that dumped a foot and a half of snow on us, and to think we were in the 70s a week ago. I'm W2XBS. From snowy Albany, New York, from the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Reporting from the K9IG News Bureau in sunny central Indiana, I'm Amy Jo Clark. And reporting from the Western Catskills, where we're in the teeth of the blizzard right now, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. The ARRL has asked the FCC to expand HF privileges for technician licensees to include limited phone privileges on 75, 40, and 15 meters, plus RIDI and digital mode privileges on 80, 40, 15, and 10 meters. For more details on the league's proposal, we go to ARRL headquarters in Newington, where Carla Pereira, KC1, HSX, files this report. The FCC has not yet invited public comment on the proposals, which stem from recommendations put forth by the ARRL Board of Directors Entry-Level License Committee, which explored various initiatives and surveyed member opinions in 2016 and 2017. Specifically, ARRL proposes to provide technician licensees, present and future, with phone privileges on 3.900 to 4.000 MHz, 7.225 to 7.300 MHz, and 21.350 to 21.450 MHz, plus digital privileges and current technician allocations on 80, 40, 15, and 10 meters. The ARRL petition points out the explosion in popularity of various digital modes over the past two decades. Under the ARRL plan, the maximum HF power level for technician operators would remain at 200 watts PEP. The few remaining novice licensees would gain no new privileges under the League's proposal. ARRL's petition points to the need for compelling incentives not only to become a radio amateur in the first place, but then to upgrade and further develop skills. Demographic and technological changes call for a periodic rebalancing between these two objectives the League maintains. 
The entry-level license committee offered very specific data and survey-supported findings about growth in amateur radio and its place in the advanced technological demographic that includes individuals younger than 30. It received significant input from ARRL members via more than 8,000 survey responses. ARRL said that after 17 years' experience with the current technician license as the gateway to amateur radio, it's urgent to make it more attractive to newcomers. ARRL said its proposal is critical to developing improved operating skills, increasing emergency communication participation, improving technical self-training, and boosting overall growth in the amateur service. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. This action will enhance the available license operating privileges in what has become the principal entry-level license class in the amateur service, ARRL said in its petition. It will attract more newcomers to amateur radio. It will result in increased retention of licensees who hold technician class licenses, and it will provide an improved incentive for entry-level licensees to increase technical self-training and pursue higher license class achievement and development of communication skills. There has not been such a rebalancing in many years, ARRL said in its petition. It is time to do that now. The FCC has not assessed entry-level operating privileges since 2005. The committee's analysis noted that today, amateur radio exists among many more modes of communication than it did half a century ago or even 20 years ago, ARRL said in its petition. Now numbering some 378,000 technician licenses comprise more than half of the U.S. amateur radio population. ARRL said its proposal will help to boost the overall growth in the amateur service, which has remained nearly inert at about 1% per year. It's urgent to make it more attractive to newcomers, in part to improve upon science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education that inescapably accompanies a healthy, growing amateur radio service, the League asserted. The entry-level license committee determined that the current technician class question pool already covers far more material than necessary for an entry-level exam to validate expanded privileges. ARRL told the FCC that it would continue to refine the examination preparation and training materials aimed at STEM topics, increase outreach and recruitment, work with amateur radio clubs, and encourage educational institutions to utilize amateur radio in STEM and other experimental learning programs. ARRL requests that the Commission become a partner in this effort to promote amateur radio as a public benefit by making the very nominal changes proposed herein in the Technician Class License Operating Privileges, the petition concluded. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm talking to Tom Frenet, K1KI, the ARRL New England Division Director, and Tom is also the Chairman of the Entry Level License Committee. And Tom, we just filed the petition for what we call technician enhancement. Can you describe that? Sure. Uh, Entry-level license committee has been in existence for about a year and a half. And uh, one of the recommendations that we made to the board was that the current uh, technician license could use some improvements to both attract new licensees and to keep the ones that we do get by giving them a a little bit broader experience on the air. The uh, recommendation we made to the board last year was that since the technician license already covers HF operating and digital and uh, voice modes, that just having access to CW segments on 80, 40, and 15 uh, was probably not modern enough for the current uh, licensees and because uh, there's been such an incredible growth in digital modes. Uh, so what we've proposed and what the board has now proposed to the FCC uh, was that the segments on 80, 40, and 15 that, were, uh, that are currently CW only for technicians be changed to allow digital modes, RIDI and, and, and all digital modes in the same uh, the same spectrum at the same power level. And you and the committee see this as potentially drawing in more amateurs, uh, giving technicians essentially more to do or more activity. Yes, um, the current you know the, the current technician license tends to encourage people to operate on VHF frequencies, but there's with the current sunspot cycle especially uh, there's there's not much activity on the HF bands uh, for technicians, so it was our feeling that that having a, a, some expanded privileges on HF would 
both get more people on the air, get uh, the current technicians more experience with uh, different kinds of operating. And also, in a lot of cases, the emergency communications community operates on both VHF, UHF, and on HF, and we'd like to make sure that the technicians can also participate on the HF side of uh, emergency communications. Oh, it sounds like a plan. Thank you very much, Tom. We'll see how it goes. Okay, very good. Thank you. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. The National Telecommunications and Information Administration has identified 3450 to 3550 megahertz for potential wireless broadband use. For more on this story, we head back to League Headquarters where Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, files this report. Amateur Radio has a secondary allocation of 3300 to 3500 megahertz, sharing the spectrum with government radars. The popular weak signal frequency is 3456.1 megahertz. The NTIA oversees the use of spectrum by federal government agencies. The FCC, in coordination with NTIA and the Defense Department, has already approved rules for its planned Citizens Broadband Radio Service in the adjacent 3550 to 3700 MHz band. In 2014, UK telecommunications regulator Ofcam announced that it was ending amateur radio access to significant portions of the 2.3 and 3.4 GHz bands following a year-long consultation that involved the release by the Ministry of Defense of 150 MHz of spectrum at 3.4 GHz to prepare for the rollout of future 5G services. Amateur radio was secondary in the UK on both bands. Ofcam said it expected the spectrum to go on auction in late March. America is the world's leader in Wi-Fi and 4G LTE, and we have claimed an early lead in bringing 5G to reality, NTIA Administrator David J. Reddell said in making the announcement. It's essential to American competitiveness that we maintain our leadership in all of these areas. The NTIA announcement is great news, according to FCC Chairman Ajit Pai. The commission, working together with NTIA, has already made the 3.5 gigahertz band available for wireless services, and we recently initiated a process to consider whether all or parts of the adjacent satellite spectrum can also be made available, Pai said. Altogether, this could unleash a contiguous block of hundreds of megahertz of valuable spectrum for new technologies and services, including 5G. Reddell said that the NTIA, in coordination with the Department of Defense and other federal agencies, has identified 100 megahertz of spectrum for potential repurposing to spur commercial wireless innovation. He said the 3450 to 3550 megahertz band could be a key asset in our nation's broadband spectrum inventory. In the U.S., military radar systems operate in the 3450 to 3550 megahertz band, and amateur radio compatibly shares the lower half of that band with the military on a secondary basis. Reddell said the Defense Department plans to submit a proposal under the Spectrum Pipeline Act to carry out a comprehensive RF engineering study to determine the potential for introducing advanced wireless services in this band without harming critical government operations. ARRL intends to contribute to NTIA's study. Online reservations for Hambenchen 2018 flea market and inside exhibit spaces are now available. Vendors who had spaces last year are being encouraged to log into their accounts to reserve them for this year's event. Online sales were delayed after it became apparent that additional buildings would not be built before Hambenchen, prompting scheduling and planning adjustments. The addition of Building 4, which was not available last year, has also made room for more inside exhibits. Hambenchen organizers said this week that both flea market and inside exhibit committees have been working hard to respond to vendors as quickly as possible. Hambenchen General Chairman Ron Kramer, K8ENJ, has asked vendors to be patient once they have entered their information for 2018. The staff is working to confirm requests as quickly as possible, Kramer said. Additional emails or information requests will only slow the process. Inside Exhibits Chairman Brian Marklin, N8UDQ, said any exhibitor who completes an online order for the same spaces by April 15th will be guaranteed those spaces. Vendors who were in tents during Hambenchen 2017 will have the option of keeping tent space or entering the pool for additional spots in Building 4, the former furniture store. 
Since we expect more people will want to move to the building than there are spaces, we've determined that a lottery was the only fair way to assign those spaces, Marklin said. Vendors staying in tents during 2018 will be moved to inside 2019 when the new building is available, he added. Because some vendors will be moving inside and to address some issues that arose last year, layouts inside tents may change significantly. Affected tent vendors will be contacted by the exhibitors committee. Both Kramer and Markland urged vendors to read the 2018 Inside Exhibits and Flea Market Rules and instructions before registering is complete. Incomplete and incorrect applications only slow the process. Contact the Flea Market, Exhibits, and Tickets Committee as appropriate. Sending emails elsewhere will only cause delay. Kramer thanked those who have already purchased spaces and tickets and said the committee is working hard to make the second year at Hamvention's new location at the Green County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio, even better than the first. Two ham astronauts were among three members of the International Space Station Expedition 54 crew that returned to Earth on February 27th after about six months in space. Astronauts Mark Van Hai, KG-5-GNP, and Joe Acaba, KE-5-DAR, landed in Kazakhstan in a Soyuz spacecraft along with cosmonaut Alexander Mishurkin. Their time on station marked the beginning of the first long-term increase in crew size on the U.S. segment, enabling NASA to double the time dedicated to science. Research highlights included investigations into the manufacturing of fiber optic filaments and microgravity, improving the accuracy of an implantable glucose biosensor, and measuring the sun's energy input to Earth. Van Hai logged 168 days in space on its first mission and conducted four spacewalks. Akaba completed one spacewalk and has now cured 306 days in space on three missions. Both participated in amateur radio on the International Space Station school contacts and other educational events. Now operating the station are Expedition 55 Commander Anton Skarpalov and Flight Engineer Scott Tingle, KG-5NZA, and Norish Kanai, Astronauts Ricky Arnold, KE-5DAU, Andrew Fustel, and Cosmonaut Oleg Artemov head to the ISS on March 21st. <laughs> Produced by amateurs, for amateurs, and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. A second beta version of the WSJTX version 1.9.0 has been released, the WSJT development group announced this week. With more on the story and the exact frequencies that will be used, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, who files this report from ARRL headquarters. A second beta version of WSJTX version 1.9.0 has been released. The release candidate, as it's called, is designated as version 1.90-RC2. An initial beta release has already been field tested by a small group of users. The WSJT development group said a primary purpose of the second beta release is to allow further field testing of the new FT-8 de-expedition mode, designed to enable de-expeditions to make FT-8 contacts at very high rates, and it is inviting the amateur radio community to participate in a public test run of FT-8 de-expedition mode on the evening of March 6, North American time. Test times and frequencies are March 6, 2300 UTC on 14.080 MHz, March 7, midnight UTC on 10.141 MHz, March 7, 0100 UTC on 7.080 MHz, and March 7, 0200 UTC on 3.585 MHz. Frequencies are not the conventional FD8 operating frequencies and are subject to change subject to conditions. According to the FT-8 de-expedition mode user guide, contacts between the de-expedition station and callers can be completed in as little as one transmission apiece by the calling station. Authorized de-expedition stations can transmit up to five signals simultaneously, allowing contact rates up to about 500 per hour under ideal conditions. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. The goal is to stimulate a rare de-expedition pilot by having many stations, or hounds, calling and trying to work a designated pseudo-de-expedition station, FOX, the announcement said. All test participants must use WSJTX version 1.9.0 release candidate 2. 
Operation will use split mode, which is already commonplace for de-expeditions. The de-expedition station, the FOX, will transmit at audio frequencies between 300 and 900 hertz. Multiple simultaneous signals will be spaced at 60 hertz intervals. Calling stations, or hounds, make initial calls anywhere in the 1,000 to 4,000 hertz range. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. The 3YOI Bouvet Island de-expedition team this week publicly invited the members of the ill-fated 3YOZ team to join forces as part of the reboot preparations for the venture. But the 3YOZ team leader, Bob Alfin, K4UEE, told AWRL his group has other planned dates for the 3YOI de-expedition. Those plans, meanwhile, remain up in the air at this point, but the team said it would announce its expected dates of operation soon. Our preparations are taking place in extraordinary times and under unusual conditions, the 3YOI team said on its website over the weekend, noting that it had suspended its initial plans to activate Bouvet Island late last year at the request of the 3YOZ de-expedition, which subsequently was forced to abort its landing and head home. In its announcement, the 3YOI team, headed by Dom Gribbs, 3Z9DX, said a joint de-expedition would give the 3YOZ team members a chance to realize their initial plans and that the 3YOI team's unprecedented decision opens new fantastic opportunities. Preparations for the 3YOI de-expedition continue. The 3YOI de-expedition team also announced it's contracted for a larger transportation vessel at really bargain rates which would permit more passengers. The vessel's crew is experienced in troop landings at Bouvet and other sub-Antarctic islands the 3YOI announcement said, Our cruise plan doesn't change. We'll depart from and sail back to Cape Town, which will reduce time and cost involved to possible minimums. The landing procedure will be supervised by landing troops and will utilize special boats that will allow the team to transport the gear and to land at the island safely. The 3YOZ de-expedition team had planned to transport personnel and equipment between its vessel and the island via helicopter, High winds and rough seas, as well as problems with one engine, prompted the captain to abort any attempted landings and head back. Move Island, a dependency of Norway, is currently the second most wanted DXCC entity. Plans appear to be on track for the upcoming 3B7A de-expedition to St. Brandon Island, expected to kick off in early to mid-April. The de-expedition initially was planned for last fall. In a news release this week, the 3B7A team said the past year of preparations has been intense and 700 kilograms of gear is now on its way to Mauritius, where it will join the generators and stock of fuel on the boat to St. Brandon Island on April 3rd with two team members. A second vessel departing on April 5th will transport the other operators. The pre-team will oversee transit operations and identify sites to install stations and equipment, but no contacts will be made until the entire team is on site, the de-expedition's organizer said. Once 3B7A is on the air, priority will be given systematically to the most difficult regions with the shortest band openings. The five identical stations are capable of working all modes available to the eight operators. 3B7A will not be active on 60 meters nor on 6 meter EME. The DXCC entity of Agaliga and St. Brandon Islands is the 28th most wanted. In DX News, if you're participating in the phone portion of the ARRL International DX Contest this weekend, you're likely to hear Z60A in Kosovo. Several local radio amateurs have been working to pin down noise sources in the area, and while 80 and 40 meters are relatively clean, 160 meters is still a challenge. The operators plan to set out beverage antennas as far as possible from whatever is generating the interference. For the third year, the North Country DX Association will field RST Suffolk stations for the entire month of March. The operation will include stations in Alaska, Yukon Territory, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and Greenland. Listen for VY1 RST slash VY0 and VE8 RST slash VY0 from Ellesmere Island, as well as KL7 RST, VY1 RST, VE8 RST, VY0 RST, and OX7 RST in Greenland. The North Country DX Association said the activity is aimed at further promoting amateur radio in northern North America. The 37th annual ARRL TAPR Digital Communications Conference will be held September 14th through the 16th at the Sheraton Albuquerque Airport Hotel in Albuquerque, New Mexico. 
Rocky Mountain Ham Radio New Mexico will be the event's local sponsor. The premier technical conference of the year, the DCC, is an international forum for radio amateurs to meet, publish their work, and present new ideas and techniques. Presenters and attendees will have the opportunity to exchange ideas and learn about recent hardware and software advances, theories, experimental results, and practical applications. Topics include software-defined radio, digital voice, digital satellite communications, global positioning systems, precision timing, APRS, digital signal processing, HF digital modes, internet interoperability with amateur radio networks, spread spectrum, adapting IEEE 802.11 and other unlicensed Part 15 systems for amateur radio using TCP slash IP networking over amateur radio, mesh and peer-to-peer -peer wireless networking, and more. Technical papers are solicited for the presentation at the conference and publication in the conference proceedings. Presentation at the conference is not required for publication. Submit papers by July 31st to Mady Weinberg, KB1EIB, or by mail to Mady Weinberg, ARRL, 225 Main Street, Newington, Connecticut, 06111. The conference website has full details and submission guidelines. ASHRAF 3V8 Stroke KF5EYY reports on the IARU Region 1 site that Tunisia has started issuing individual amateur radio licenses. After issuing the ministerial decree allowing for Tunisians to acquire their individual licenses in September, and after arranging for the first amateur radio exam on December 20, 2017, the Tunisian regulator, ANF, has delivered last Friday the first licenses of amateur radio. That happened in ANF offices in Tunis with the presence of ANF director and employees, representatives from the TIC ministry, and some ARAP members. It was a nice opportunity to thank ANF director for his efforts leading this project to success and offer him and his employees contact sport book on behalf of all ARAP members. On Tuesday, February 27th, a helium high altitude balloon carrying instruments, cameras, and a ham VHF transmitter was launched near Syracuse, New York. The balloon, a project of Chris Murphy, KD2MRV, the Gloversville High School teachers, leader of the program Teachers in Space and director of high altitude balloon operations, involved coordination of students and ham operators along the route of the flight. Digital data from various sensors of altitude, GPS, temperature was relayed via a VHF link using low power to Gloversville High School, where it was inputted to the Internet via network. A Google Earth map with waypoints and data could then be seen worldwide. The balloon reached a height of 75,000 feet, traveling at a maximum speed of 120 miles an hour, and finally came to rest near Middleburg, New York. Students from the Kanajahari school system kept a sharp eye out for the balloon and participated in the project as part of the STEM program. Involved in the tracking and data processing and the recovery of the balloon were Tryon Amateur Radio Club members Don Gifford, WA2EZ, Howard Selwitz, KD2ABK, Gary Harrington, KD2GEH, Joe O'Neill, KB2TJE, Scott Turner, W8NUD, Earl Ward, KR2L, Mike Patino, N2BMU, Jim Hartman, KC2JJQ, Kevin James, KD2FPM, and Corey Tallarico, KD2HXE. Also involved from the student side were the high altitude achievement students, Jason Denny, Maya Rivera, Skylar Reed, and Brent Muehlberger. The high altitude achievement group is a student run project based suborbital balloon launching group from the Gloversville High School and the Canajahari School District. The objective is to study various aspects of the Earth's troposphere and stratosphere. You can see data and the map at http stroke stroke aprs dot fi slash telemetry slash a slash k two j j i dash eleven. We are this week in amateur radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Let me just log in here to my computer. And let's see, what is, uh, what is new in the tech world? It's kind of funny to think about Windows 7. Feel, you know, maybe it's just me, but it feels like that's you know, a relatively modern version of Windows. came out in 2009. It's almost it's almost uh, nine years old. It'll be nine years old this year, and of course, then there was 8.0, 8.1. We're out now up to Windows 10. It, it it's it's several years old itself, isn't it? it? Feels like that's the new Windows. 
It's also, according to Microsoft, the last Windows. They're not going to do a Windows 11, at least. I know it's hard to say never, right? Never say never. But it, but the idea is that they will. You'll just when you get a computer, you'll get when Apple does this. In effect, you get a comp operating system with a computer, OS 10, or in the case of a PC, you get Windows 10, and then it just uh, every every uh, year Apple updates. Every uh, uh, Apple, Microsoft says maybe every six months they're going to update Windows 10. It'll have some new features. Of course, they'll continually update for bugs and security flaws. And just, you just kind of hum along. And in a way, that matches how people used Windows. And it's why I think uh, we had a caller last hour who was, couldn't get his Windows 7. He reinstalled it, couldn't get it to activate. And Microsoft said, well, you just get 10, which is not the right answer. It's a little miffed of Microsoft, you know, trying to upsell him. No, don't get, you, you can use Windows 7. Perfectly good. But really, in the old days, that's what you did. I mean, he wants to stick with Windows 7 because he's used to the fact that when you use a PC, you don't upgrade the operating system. You just but when you when it's you know you get the new the current operating system. Whenever you buy a new computer, you get whatever's new. So when he when he gets a new computer, he sure it'll have Windows 10 on it. But there's no reason to upgrade till then. That's how Microsoft did it for years. Sure, they sold you know you could buy an upgrade version, and geeks like us would have would do that because we wanted the latest greatest. But it is the case, generally speaking, that upgrading an operating system is risky, potentially hazardous. So, uh, you know, just use the operating system it came with until you get a new computer. Then you get the new operating system. Very few people, I think, actually went out and bought Windows to upgrade it. Now, Microsoft's upgrades are fairly hefty these days, the, the updates that they do. We've got one coming in the uh, next few weeks, I would guess. They did. They did uh, two last year. They did the, uh, the a spring update and then the fall creators update. And uh, they we're going to do a spring creators update. The uh, the technical name for it is eighteen oh three because it it's expect which tells us it's going to come out in the third month of twenty eighteen eighteen oh three, which means it will probably be offered to you as a free upgrade. You know, you get a little pop up that says, "Would you? You know, we got a big upgrade for you. You want it?" Maybe not uh, in March, maybe in early April, but sometime soon. Not going to be a big change, but it is. I get, Microsoft doesn't want us to call us call it a service pack, but it's kind of like the remember the service packs. You'd get Windows Seven Service Pack One, Windows XP Service Pack Three. It's kind of like those, and this will go on forever. <laughs> once once you uh, once you have Windows Ten installed on a PC, if you upgraded it from Windows Seven or Eight. Or you buy a PC with Windows 10, that's it. You're done. You don't have to buy another version of Windows. It'll upgrade automatically forever. And apparently there won't be a new uh, Windows 11, at least anytime in the near future. It's interesting, isn't it, that, that we don't get new operating systems anymore? Really, this is, uh, there, there, there are four primarily operating systems. There's, the biggest one, of course, is Windows. The operating system is the software that makes gives your computer its personality. PCs and Macs are very similar hardware-wise, but they're very different when you use them because PCs use Windows and Macs use OS X. They're the two biggest. Then there is Linux. You hear us talk about it, and there are lots of flavors of Linux, but they're all very similar. So I'll call out all one operating system, on the desktop anyway. And then uh, there are uh, there's a bunch of Unix-like operating systems called BSD, FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD, TrueOS. They're all essentially the same, too. So there's really four big ones. There's lots of little ones. There's specialized operating systems like QNX that runs in cars. There's iOS and Android for mobile devices. But we haven't seen a new, new operating system in a long time. Decades, really. Will there ever be a new one, I wonder? Maybe we're just gonna—they're just gonna keep taking the creaky old guys and patching them up, putting a fresh coat of paint on, and saying it's new. I wonder if we'll ever again. We, of course, we will, right? But when and by and from whom? In a way, you could say the new operating system is the internet. You know, I, I guess I left out one operating system, the Google operating system, Chrome OS, which is—it's funny because that's the one I'm always telling people to get. Uh, but really, Chrome OS isn't. An operating system in the well, it is and it isn't an operating system in the Windows or Mac OS sense. It's not a generalized operating system. It's really just support for one program, Chrome, a browser. The operating system, in some ways, really is the internet, isn't it? The apps, the the things you do, it all happen on the internet. That's really the biggest change that's happened over the last twenty years. 
that it doesn't really matter what operating system you're using. If you're using Chrome on Mac OS or Chrome on Windows, it's very much the same. Or Chrome on Chrome OS or Chrome on Android, it's very much the same. The Internet is now our operating system. And we just use our computers as a window <laughs> to, the, to the Internet. Somebody's mentioning WebOS. Yeah, that was a fun OS. Palm Computer made that for its mobile device, the Palm Pre. Remember that? Do you remember that? That was 10 years ago. It kind of never went anywhere, and now it's built into TVs. Is it Which TV uses uh, WebOS? Is it the LG? I can't remember. If there's a new OS, it won't be what we think of as an OS. It won't be something that you install on the hard drive of a device, of a computer, and then boot into, and now you're in the OS. I don't think it'll look like that. I think you could make an argument that, in a way, Amazon's Echo is an OS. Google Assistant is an, OS, is an operating system, isn't it? And more and more, that's kind of what it's going to be. You're going to talk to or interact with something that doesn't really seem to have a, a physical presence anywhere. It just It's just everywhere. It's around you. I, I imagine that's what's going to happen next. That your OS won't really be an OS. It'll be an entity that is with you wherever you go. Maybe you'll even form a bond, a relationship with it. It'll certainly under, start to understand you and know, know your preferences, be able to respond to you personally. Kind of like that that movie Her, right? But I just feel like the next thing will be like Her. It'll be ambient, and it'll feel like it's yours. I think it'll 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 uh, it'll learn from you. I mean, this is the promise of computing for years. It'll learn from you. It'll learn your preferences. It'll know what you mean. Right now, my my Echo is just a pain in the ass. Excuse me, pain in the butt. <laughs> this morning, okay. So part of it's partly my problem because I have effectively three echoes in this in proximity to each other i have one next to my bed i have one in the bathroom and i have one in my in my closet we have a walk-in closet and they all hear me when i say echo i'd say the trigger word they all hear me so i've actually I have four because <laughs> i have an echo one in my closet and i still have that echo spot that alarm clock that lisa won't let me put anywhere where there's because it's got a camera in it so that's also in the in my side of the closet <laughs> it can only see me and I really just use it as an alarm clock. So really, there's four devices that will respond. There's only three trigger words. And I'm in the shower, and I'm trying to get some music. This is my mistake. I'm in the shower. I'm trying to get some music. So I'm shouting. I wanted to hear the Game of Thrones theme. So I'm shouting, Echo, play the Game of Thrones theme. And for some reason, the one nearest to me did not respond. The one in the bedroom responded. And then I, then I, so, but I couldn't hear it. So I thought, so I said, Echo, play some rock and roll. So the Echo in the bathroom heard that one and starts playing some Chuck Berry music. But I've got Chuck Berry now mixed with the Game of Thrones theme. I get out of the shower and it's like, it's like they're crazy. And I said, and I said, Echo, stop. And no, neither one will stop. It's like they have a mind of their own. This is the future, isn't it? <laughs> this is the future. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Lord. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Foundations of Amateur Radio. From time to time, people move and their shack tends to move with them. For me, that move is happening right now. I'm moving all of 900 metres up the road, a long story in itself, but perhaps best told over a campfire far from civilization. As I started the process of working out what needed to be done, I realised that I made a few rookie errors. The first one, one that I've made before, but at the time my excuse was that I knew nothing about amateur radio. Some say I still don't. This time I was busy focusing on above ground power, pole top transformers and high speed internet. I forgot to check mobile phone coverage, forgot to bring a radio and forgot to listen on HF. I will no doubt find out what the state of these things is when I actually move in a few days from now. But my rationalisation was essentially, I'm not able to operate from home as it is, so it won't get any worse, and if I'm lucky, it might get better. 
Frankly, I didn't have the heart to tell my long-suffering partner that there was yet another condition, you know, among the must-have actual proper internet, not the promise of one next year, must-have space for my office, and a place that can be locked up in the garage. I skipped the must-be-amateur-radio-friendly tick box for familial peace, and as I said, it cannot get worse, and it might get better. Looking around my office now, it occurs to me that I'm going to have to remove the coax that runs through the window, which involves either cutting the coax or desoldering the connector. I suspect that it will become the most expedient of the two, given that the desoldering involves having to find my soldering iron among the half-packed-up house. Cutting looks like it. I'll tell myself that it's good because I'll find out if my coax is waterlogged, but between you and me, it's because I'm impatient to get moving. The remaining part of this is the thing that's on the other end of the coax, the metal shiny thing on the roof, known to most of the amateur community as a 10 metre vertical. A metal rod resonant on the 10 metre band about 2 metres long clamped to the gable of my pergola will have to come down. Of course at that point I'll be off the air. No counting how long that will last, but I'm hopeful that a quick and dirty magnetic mount will get me up and running shortly after the move. Of course, in an ideal world, I'd already have measured out the future radio shack, have a room away from the house, insulated, away from the fence line, lots of backyard with a choice selection of high trees, no noisy neighbours, council regulations that encourage radio amateurs, and a coffee machine, a bed, and while I'm at it, air conditioning. Who am I kidding? I'll likely be able to put my radio somewhere in a corner on my desk, much like it is right now. And if I'm lucky, I'll be able to be on air without disturbing the family. This all in stark contrast with a friend of mine who asked the community a simple question. Where would you put your radio shack if you needed fast internet and nearby medical services? Anywhere in the state. The answers were many and varied, from ludicrous to amazing, from off the cuff to well researched, just waiting for the win on the weekend lottery to be able to pay for it. Our shack is an integral part of our hobby, and while I see some amateurs go out of their way to find and position their ideal shack, I see many more just making do with what they have. No doubt there is a balance to be found. I'm curious to hear what criteria do you have for your shack, what things are essential and what would be nice to have. If money wasn't a problem, what would your ideal shack look like, and where would it be? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1947, the Atlantic City Conference. Amateurs lose the top 300 kilocycles of 10 meters from 29.7 through 30 megacycles and will lose the 14.35 to 14.4 megacycle segment on 20 meters, but they will gain a new band at 15 meters, which will run from 21.0 to 21.45 megacycles in the future. To compensate hams for their loss, the FCC allows them to use the 11 meter band, which runs from 26.96 to 27.23 megacycles on a shared basis with industrial, scientific, and medical devices. TVI is starting to become a problem. The ARRL determines that Channel 2 is very vulnerable to TVI and recommends that it be eliminated, but the FCC removes Channel 1 instead. Also in 1947, the transistor was developed by Bell Labs. 1948. Single sideband is fully described in the amateur publications. The FCC creates Class A and Class B CB radio between 460 and 470 megacycles. 1951. The FCC completely reorganizes the amateur license system. The Class A, Class B, and Class C licenses are replaced by the Advanced, General, and Conditional class respectively. Three new license classes are created. The Amateur Extra, Novice, and Technician. The technician class is created for experimentation, not communication, and has privileges only above 220 megacycles. 
Novices are given limited HFCW subbands, 75 watts, and crystal control only. They may also use phone on 145 through 147 megacycles. The novice is a one-year, non-renewable license. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. And now, with his segment on working amateur radio satellites, here is AMSAT North America's own Bruce Page, KK5DO. Soon, hams will have yet another FM repeater to use. On February 28th, Roland PY4ZBZ received the voice message from Pixat. The message was, quote, Enjoy your weekend with lots of good apple pie. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe, unquote. The FM repeater on Pixat was tested on February 15th and is not operational at this time. The downlink for listening to the telemetry, the Pixat messages, and the FM repeater is 435.525 MHz. The uplink when the repeater is turned on will be 145.910 MHz. It will also require a 1750 Hz tone to activate the transponder when it is available. AMSAT Vice President of Operations Drew KO4MA reported that Falcon Sat 3 has had a software crash after some 850 days uptime. The operations team will need to reload the software. Drew mentioned, quote, even though you might hear telemetry, the BBS and Digipeter will be off until we are complete. Please attempt no transmissions until AMSAT's operations team releases Falcon Sat 3 back to general use. Your cooperation is appreciated, unquote. Thanks to the AMSAT News Service for this week's bulletins. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. Are you heading to Hamvention this year? The Dayton Hamvention has added another way to communicate, the more time-sensitive types of information, text alerts. According to the Hamvention.org website, hams can sign up for the text alerts from the official Hamvention staff and the National Weather Severe Weather Watch and Warning Service. To sign up for the text alert service, text HAMVENTION18 to number 888777. Once again, that's HAMVENTION18 to the text number 888777. Once you successfully sign up, you'll receive a confirmation text welcoming you to the service. When signing up a few days ago, 123 people had already registered. There's no charge for the service, but as always, message and data rates may apply depending on your cell phone plan. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. From the suburban Chicago studios of the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Larry McGlure, KB9DIP, with the February 24th Rain Report. If you have been following solar propagation reports over the years, you probably have read propagation columns from Thomas Hood, NW7US. Thomas has been featured a few times on these rain report hamcasts. However, this is the first time we have featured him telling his story. Here's the first of two excerpts from an hour-long conversation between Thomas and Eric Guth, 4Z1UG. I was a young boy living in Montana and my parents gave us more or less free reign when we're not in school and being a very curious boy I would go through the house looking for things of interesting playability things that I could invent imaginative scenarios I would rummage through my dad's belongings and discovered cameras and a radio I secreted the radio away down a few houses from where we lived went underneath the porch and began trying to figure out what this radio did. And I figured out how to turn it on. And I began turning knobs, extending the antenna. Man, the exotic sounds that came out of this one segment of the radio. When I switched this knob to something called SW, I was fascinated. There were weird sounds coming out of this thing. And then I came across this monotone clicking And all of a sudden I heard National Institute of Standards and Technology Time. This is radio station WWV, Fort Collins, Colorado. And gave the time. At the tone, 20 hours, 58 minutes. 
coordinated universal time. Why would anybody tell me the time on a radio and click out the seconds? It was obvious that these clicks were seconds being ticked away. So I would just sit there and listen and listen and listen, kind of going off into dreamland a little bit. And then somebody came on and said, Solar Flux 87, estimated planetary index 11. The estimated planetary index at 2100 UTC on 21st August was total. How many sunspots there were and that we had a geomagnetic storm, which I had no clue what any of that meant. But that was the spark for a lifelong curiosity about our sun and about whatever it was that these people were talking about on this little radio underneath the porch in Montana. And as I continued to experiment day after day during the summer, I heard, this is Radio South Africa. This is the BBC. This is the Voice of America. Radio Australia. Deutsche Welle. I was like, wow people talking from all over the world. How could that work? Did you have to come out from under the porch at some point and, and confront your father that you'd found a radio? No, I never told them for quite a while. Over the years, the one that I had as a child disappeared somewhere. But when I was at this ham fest, I came across the same exact radio. It's basically a Sony four band portable radio, horrible receiver. But at the time I didn't have any clue as to what was good or bad. It was just what it was. I posted that on Facebook, and my dad, who's also on Facebook, saw that and he goes, hey, that's the radio I bought when I was in Germany all the time in my car because it was able to be mounted in a vehicle. And I said, yeah, that was the first radio that I ever used, and it got me started with outside of the computer side of things. It's what I do with my life. And he goes, yeah, I always wondered what happened to that. It disappeared. <laughs> well, it's because I stole it. <laughs> So, so after, you know, so many years, that was in the 1970s, early 70s, that I secreted that radio away. And speaking of that, like I told you, I was always curious. I would take a lot of my dad's belongings, even alarm clocks, and I would disassemble them and then try to put them back together again. Because I wanted to figure out how they worked, and then I put them back together. Usually, I could put the thing back together, and it'll all be fine and worked. But alarm clocks, once in a while, I had extra little things laying around. And then they didn't have an alarm clock that worked. We'd go out and get another one, take that apart. I got in trouble a lot because of that. In Missoula, we lived on a military base. It's called Fort Missoula. 70s, there was a Navy reserve unit that had this long building that interior was redesigned as a simulated ship. They had an engine room and, and all sorts of different parts of a ship. Of course, that was fascinating to me as a young boy. So I would go in there and I would watch them do their drills and I would just observe mostly. But when they weren't there and drilling, I the building and I was looking at things like the telephone wires that came in and <laughs> I would pull that. Of course, their phones never worked, and they were trying to figure out why. It's because I was playing around with this stuff. And I got, like I said, in huge trouble. But my mind was so active and so curious about the scientific side of things, wires and electricity. Yes, I was the boy that stuck things into an outlet and went boom with the electrical arc between two things. Got myself shocked, assembling anything electronic and trying to put it back together. My dad caught on to bring home these Radio Shack 150 in one project springs and you wire things together and they had the resistors and the transistors and a meter and a speaker and a Morse code key that was just basically bent metal with a little plastic knob on it. He brought books home and fed my curiosity and that was the start in radio. So how did you find your way into amateur radio? Well I continued to beg information. We were at church and I had a book on tubes listening to the sermon. I wasn't paying attention to the ethereal. I was in this book reading about tubes and how they worked. And I had a little sketch pad and I was drawing a tube diagram and I was just trying to copy and absorb all this information. And I guess there was somebody in the pew behind me who was an amateur radio operator, but he didn't come directly to me. He took my dad aside privately. Your son will knack for electronics. I'm an amateur radio operator, 
and I'd like to give you information, some books and materials that you can give him to continue his. I was my first introduction to amateur radio indirectly through this connection. I'm not sure why the guy didn't talk directly to me. Maybe my dad said no or something. I don't know. I have a clue. But that was my first exposure. But then there was no amateur radio exposure for a very long time. From the kid perspective, I think it was about four or five years later, we had moved from Montana down to Salt Lake City. My dad was restationed by the U.S. Army to an installation in Salt Lake City. It was in Salt Lake City that I came across this huge tower, a big antenna, and I went, radio, I know what that is. So I went over there and I boldly knocked on the door. I said, you have a big antenna. Do you do radio? And that was where I first began to get Elmer directly on a radio. He gave me Amico records where I would go and listen to two words a minute, five words a minute. And I slowly began to learn Morse code the wrong way, I think now. But there was to me by my first Elmer. Tom Billis, maybe. I have no clue what his call was. He's a silent key. I think it was in the 90s that I discovered that he had passed away. The site, I think, was about 76 or 77. So what year did you get your first license, and how old were you? Well, there's the journey. See, I got Elmer, and I learned Morse code. But because I was a military brat, we started doing a lot more moving around. In Montana, I stayed there a good stint because my dad was able to to convince the Army to let him stay there as long as possible because he just absolutely loved Montana. But then the military started moving us around. So after Salt Lake City, we moved back to Montana for a very short period, and then we moved up to Alaska. This first Elmer of mine, though, did give me my second shortwave receiver. It was made by Collins, an interesting radio. I'm trying to remember the nomenclature specifically. I'll have to go look at where I can find that. But it was the most amazing radio. It dwarfed anything that portable radio could hear. So when we moved from Salt Lake, short stint in Montana, then we went up to Alaska. Well, in Alaska, I erected a wire antenna around my bedroom, along the walls, with the darkness of winter almost all of the day and months of time just absorbing of shortwave from one end to the other, and even AM DXing. And I heard stations during the nighttime with that makeshift antenna. You're listening to the first of two excerpts from an interview, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, with Thomas Hood, NW7US. Known worldwide for his propagation columns, he's written for various shortwave and ham publications. So from Salt Lake up to Montana to Alaska, and then Alaska back to Montana. School... Just graduating is a real quick story. I went into own business. I was an entrepreneur. I went into satellite TV, sold satellite TVs, and I also did computer stuff. Because along the way, my dad became a computer salesman, brought home computers, and I started learning computers. So that was a natural thing for me to do is become this business person, started a business, had clients, did programming, and installed satellite TV. I got a partner. The partner embezzled. All of a sudden, I got sued. My lawyer said, you know the best thing for you right now? Let me handle exonerating you in court, but you should probably join the Army and just get the heck out of Montana. Because at that point, we had come back to Montana. And I said, join the Army with his life. I don't know if I want to do that. Well, I talked with my dad, and he convinced me, yeah, it's a good idea. You should do it. It's college fun and all that. So I joined the Army, and I went into the Signal Corps. I was a signal man, and I did shortwave stuff, and I did satellite stuff in the Army. So that childhood experience, radio, and learning about propagation, because I got books on propagation in the ionosphere, all of that lent itself to being a signal man in the Army. Amazing things while I was in the Army because of my knowledge. When I got out of the Army, Connecticut, I worked at the Travelers as a programmer, and my supervisor was a ham radio operator. So he was my second ham radio Elmer to relearn the code and he and some other ham radio operator eventually gave me a novice test in the cafeteria, Morse code, and I had to receive Morse code to their satisfaction, and I got my novice license, and that was 1990. And what was your call sign? KA1VGL. KA1, very good lasagna. I stayed at the trailers for about a year. <laughs> this is a negative, but I got custody of the kids. Had no interest in, at that time, 
being a mother. So I ended up with kids and I was working at the Travelers. They allowed me to telecommute for a bit, but it was just too difficult with, with basically an infant and a toddler to work all day and have two kids and being somewhat a new dad. I had dad back in Montana who had retired in Montana and my mom there said, well, why don't you come back to Montana and we'll help you raise the kids? And I thought that was a pretty good prospect. So I gave my notice at the Travelers, gear and other belongings and drove to Montana. When I got to Montana, this is a prime time for me to get a new call sign. And since it was a regulation that when you move into a new region, you had to refile anyway, FCC assigned me N7 PMS. Horrible call sign for a guy, especially once I got to 80 meters. <laughs> Check in to these nightly round tables. I give my call N7 PMS and man, it would be five to 10 minutes of ribbing, but I chose different phonetics than what people think of PMS, Montana skunk. So that's what I pushed anytime people were ribbing me of PMS. So you're new in Montana. Did you get a rig at that point? I was still using the Kenwood 520S as my first rig. By the way, that was given to me by my second Elmer at the Travelers. He wanted to inspire me and get air. So he said, hey, I've got this old Kenwood TS520S. I'm going to give that to you as your first rig and as my gift that you passed your novice test and get on the air and operate. Let me build my first antenna, which was a random length of wire and a ground. And it was a Dentron tuner, which was about the size of two shoe boxes. Amazing Dentron manual tuner. Didn't that have a roller inductor inside? Yeah. I don't think you see those very much anymore. A lot of tuners have fixed points on the coils. I think they don't make things the way they used to. There was some really great construction in some of those older companies like Dentron. Long story short, after Montana, I moved to Washington State to find better opportunity for work. That did help as a single dad. I was a single dad for 11 years. So I was raising those boys by myself and ham radio still played a huge role for me. And I, through the years, upgraded until I got to amateur extra. And I had 520S, I went to a Kenwood 830, I think it was, an 830, which was a really nice radio. It had the WARC work bands, which like 30 meters and of those. So I got more spectrum and enjoyed, I began learning about 30 meters and, and what it was capable of. And I did a lot of ham radio stuff in Washington State, the Evergreen State. That's where, when I upgraded to Amateur Extra, I applied for a vanity call for the NW7US to get away from that PMS call. And I chose NW7US because I am a huge fan of the Pacific Northwest in Montana. Montana is not considered the Pacific Northwest, but it's adjacent to it. So in my mind, anything Northwest United States is just beautiful. And so I wanted to promote that love by getting a call sign NW7US. And there were no NW7 prefixes taken by anybody. And even though I could have gone with a one by two call sign, I chose the two by two call sign because I wanted to promote the Northwest seven United States. I had this really excellent friend, Mitch NA7US is a call sign that he applied for after he saw my call sign. He went, hey, I like that idea. So he got North America 7US. Do you think that hams still enjoy shortwave listening? And do you think that it would make us better operators if we listened more? Oh, that's key. Great that you brought that up. There are a lot of people that don't listen well. I believe in my case that the extensive hours that I listened to shortwave and I listened to air traffic, I listened to mariners, I listened to military operations, and of course, I listened to a lot of ham radio, both Morse code and voice. And I gained a sense of more than just an etiquette, but a skill in communicating well the message that you're trying to convey. What I've heard from a number of operators, they say that if you spend enough time listening to a pileup, for example, in a, in a contest, you start to figure out what the receiving station is doing. I mean, what, the guy that's actually running the pileup, you, you kind of get a sense of where he's going to show up or where he's listening. Absolutely. And, and in that that's sense, a lost skill. Right. In that sense, that was kind of the point of my question. But if we're listening more, then we kind of figure out what people are doing. 
Oh, I love the DXing hunt and pileups. I was a new ham, still living in Connecticut. And code, it's a little bit different than voice, but the same criteria of the hunt exists. You've got to listen carefully to find his modus operandi. What is that operator doing? How does he work that split? Does he go up? Does he go down? Uh, does he stay on a single frequency for a bit? What's his rhythm? And what's the rhythm of the pileup? Because I think a pileup begins to have its own rhythm. And if you can figure that out by listening for a while, and that's the trick too, because it may not be a long opening. So you got to get in there before the opening closes if conditions are marginal. But if you've got a good knack for listening to the rhythm of things, you'll find that opening. And man, I loved with 100 watts and a random piece of wire, I broke so many pileups. And I think that ability to break pileups, like the first or second call, I would be able to work the DX in really heavy pileups with 100 watts in a simple piece of wire. And again, I think the, the long time of listening to shortwave, the years before that, I just had the knack to hear that rhythm and find out where that opening was where I could insert myself between the two beats, everybody calling and the guy moving just a little bit in frequency. So yes, the answer is absolutely learning how to listen, to grasp the rhythm of the pileup or whatever your environment's giving you out to success, in my opinion. It's not the huge antenna and the kilowatts and calling over and over and over and over and over and hoping that eventually something sticks to the wall. The thoughts of propagation columnist Thomas Hood NW7US shared with Eric Guth for Z1UG. We'll bring you our second and final excerpt from their conversation next time. I'm Larry McGlore, KB9DIP, bidding you a very 73 from the Radio Amateur Information Network. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. The RSGB reports that no nominations have been received for President 2018 to 2020, and the post is now being re-advertised. The closing date is midnight on April 26th. A post on the Society's website says, if an election is required, details will be published in the June edition of RADCOM, available in mid-May. The current president, Nick Henwood, G3RWF, has agreed to continue until the process is complete. In the following brief talk, current RSGB president talks about the role of president, what it is, what it isn't, and how it can be shaped to an individual's strengths and amateur radio interests. Here now is the Radio Society of Great Britain's president, Nick Henwood, G3RWF. Hello, I'm uh, Nick Henwood. I'm uh, G3RWF, and I'm the Radio Society of Great Britain president. There have been presidents in the RSGB since 1913, so I'm not exactly the first one out of the box. But despite that, as I go around talking to members and seeing clubs, quite a lot of people don't have much of an idea of what I do, or indeed the full extent of what the RSGB does. So I think there are quite a lot of misconceptions around. So I'd like to spend a few minutes today telling you about the role, what it is, what it isn't, and how it can be tailored to an individual's skills and amateur radio interests. So firstly, what does the president do? Well, you could say it's a prestigious and important role. I think that's true representing the RSGB and its members at events. I also think it's really important that you're passionate about amateur radio. I've been doing it for many years now. So you need to be in there rooting for amateur radio and supporting radio amateurs. And I think it's almost a requirement that anybody wanting to be president should uh, have a bit of a profile regarding amateur radio and be well known. The president is also a board director, and that's a serious responsibility, and I, I wouldn't want to minimize that. Being on the board means you've got an opportunity to be involved in change and development. So you realize this is a serious responsibility and some previous knowledge or certainly willingness to undertake some training is important. But to get to lighter things, you need to enjoy meeting people and talking to them as that's a very big part of the role. It helps if you're comfortable giving talks and presenting awards. I've really enjoyed finding out lots and lots of things I didn't know about the RSGB and in particular things that clubs are doing and helping to highlight some innovative ideas that uh, members and clubs can, can share. So that's been terrific. Yes, I, it takes some of your time and you have to w work out exactly how uh, that could fit into, into your lifestyle. But how much 
time you spend does rather depend on your own individual approach to the job. Well, that's a broad brush view of some of the core points. I think I'll just try a few myths. They're always good fun. The president has to attend every event. Nonsense. The president does not have to attend every event everywhere in the country. You choose what you can get to, you choose the important ones, and your colleagues on the board share that role with you, in particular uh, the, the chairman of the board and the general manager. Next thing, the president needs to know absolutely everything about the RSGB and amateur radio. Well, you know, there's an answer to that, and that you say, you say straight-faced that you don't know the answer and you'll go and find it out for people. You don't, you're not expected to know absolutely everything, but you do need to know a fair bit. If you haven't got an idea of the overall shape of what's going on and what we're trying to achieve, then you'll find yourself at a disadvantage. Another point is that the president actually has quite a lot of freedom. There aren't any particular and specific projects which the president has to get involved in. I think making a mark is probably more important than actually what it's in. What can the role be? Well, first of all, being, the, being president is a great opportunity. I think you can, uh, you, you can have a really interesting and exciting time as president. So it's enjoyable. I think that needs to come across as well. You need to be seen to be enjoying it. You need to enjoy being a figurehead, not lashed to the front of the boat, but uh, there in front of the RSGB. Sometimes it's demanding, but any job worth doing will be demanding from time to time, and you need to get the balance right. You need to be passionate. I've already used that word perhaps too much, but that needs to be evident to people that you're really keen on the job and you are really keen on the RSGB. I belong to that generation that joined the RSGB because we thought that radio amateurs needed to be represented nationally in order to hold on to and enhance the privileges we already have. You also need to be someone who members are proud of. Don't mean that in a silly way, but uh, you want members to, to look at the president doing things and think, actually, I'm pleased to belong to the organisation that that person's uh, talking about at, that sp at this particular moment. Finally, you do have to give commitment to the job. That means you've got to be clear about what you can do and you have to be clear about what you can't do so people don't depend on you and then, and then find themselves let down. So I think that's important with most jobs, but perhaps it's particularly important in a volunteer role. I know I've really enjoyed my two years as president, and you'll gain certainly as much, if not more, than you give in that role. And it'll be, it will be experience that you will remember as you join all those presidents stretching back to, uh, to 1913. If you'd like to contact me to talk about whether you might become the president, uh, please contact me via president at rsgb.org org.uk. I hope you'll give it some serious thought about how you can carry on what's been a really quite a remarkable tradition of presidents within the RSGB. So now it's over to you. And another news from Great Britain this week comes word that the RSGB has announced their web hosting service for amateur radio clubs will close down for good on March 29th, 2018. On the FAQ page, the Society says, there are now many better ways to host your club website, whether that's on free or paid for web hosting or social media. And finally this week, the Internet of Things is always growing, and now comes word from the huge electronic show in Barcelona this week that a company has developed shoes that communicate via Morse code. These so-called smart shoes have been created to let industrial workers keep in touch via toe-type coded messages. The footwear was inspired by Morse code, but made possible by the latest communications technologies. We have this report from BBC technology correspondent Rory Sellen Jones, who met up with the firm responsible at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. In the era of the Internet of Things, it seems everything is connected, including safety shoes. This one has got uh, a SIM card in it. Jean Francois Vincent from yeah. Sierra Wireless. This is inside, what's it doing? So this uh, product is uh, embedding a uh, so smart SIM, SIM card plus wireless module to send a message from a worker, so safety message to his team to uh, send an alert, for instance, or get the other way around, a message from his manager telling him to uh, stay safe in case of hurricane or a big danger. Two-way communications. How does 
the person wearing this boot communicate. So just uh, moving up a tool or just pushing a, on a button of this shoe, uh, it will send a message directly over the air uh, to his team or the other way around. The manager can send the message and the uh, uh, shoe will vibrate to telling them there is a message and do a lot of noise, so 80 decibel uh, sound, so to warn him about alert. The boot will shout at him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and just to be clear, the, the worker actually has to learn a sort of Morse code, so use yeah. their toes to twitch to exactly. say, I'm in trouble. Exactly, a long s signal uh, is for red alert, and if you want a, a small alert, you, it's only twice, short ones and the same when you receive a message back from uh, your team it's the same uh, alphabet uh, that that send you the messages and we can see it's come up on the screen there's a, a, a red alert come out that somewhere in Barcelona someone with a shoe is in trouble can I ask is this serious this sounds slightly crazy no no it's a uh, highly serious so we are working with utility big utilities for deployment because it is saving so cost, a lot of insurance cost. So there is a huge economy for insurance and the employer of the worker. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, K2CT, on 145.19 MHz in New Scotland, New York, owned and operated by the Albany Amateur Radio Association. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at twiar.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.